Get right into my message today. Um, my message is, is, is entitled Required. Required. The word required is <clears throat> it's kind of a root word uh, for requirement. And if you've ever traveled before, if you ever went overseas, especially really to get onto the plane, you need to give them a what? You need to show them what? If you travel overseas, you, you need to give a passport. And, and if you're going to get into that country, you need to make sure you keep that passport with you. We used to do a lot of youth trips, uh, uh, overseas youth trips. And man, uh, no, no, we would get that kid and they would get on the plane and then they would lose their passport on the plane. And, then, and, and so if that happens, they're just going to turn you right around because you, you can't get into the country with, without a passport. Why? Be, because it's required. And you know, we, the Word of God says that we are saved by grace. We, we know that. But even, even the Word of God tells us, Jesus tells us, he, this very controversial statement. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, he gives a requirement, no one comes to God except through me. So there, there are requirements uh, that, that we need to be careful of. And so I love the great vision that New Life has for this community center. I love, I love when we came here a, a, a few weeks ago and heard about this great vision, and, and then we saw on social media that you're, you're breaking the dirt and you're, you're moving forward. And, and I just love to be a part of a church or walk into a church where there's a great vision. And, and this is what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians about vision. He says, when, when you're in vision, he says, when, when, you, when you're in that process, he says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now, because how many of you know when you engage in a great vision, there's challenges that come your way, right? There's challenges. He says, rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. We focus on the vision God has given us. For the things we see now will soon be gone. They're temporary. The challenges that this church might be facing, the challenges you might be facing, it's temporary. But the things we cannot see will last forever. You see, God has an eternal vision for our lives. God has an eternal vision for this church. He has an eternal vision for this community. And so this church, I see, you refuse to see the obstacles. You refuse to stay stuck in the barriers or the challenges that you might be facing and moving forward this vision of a community center. Right? And I love that about that church. Give, this, give yourselves a hand. I want you to get this takeaway. This is the entire takeaway from the message. So you, you want to just get this takeaway, you can tune me out for the rest. Some of you are like, I did that a while ago. Here's the takeaway. A great vision requires a great response. A great vision from God requires a great response from his people. And I believe that this church is in the midst of a great vision. Because we know that, that God can give a great vision to a great church. But if a church stands still and there is no response, it simply becomes a dream. And it remains a dream. And it stays that dream that stays stuck on a church. What, or it, it stays stuck on that. What is a vision? I, I like Andy Stanley's definition of vision. He says vision is a mental picture of what could be. And it's fueled by a passion that it should be. So I, I don't know how this vision came about for a community center. But I think it's a great vision. But I, I think it must have came about by... Pastor Jason talking with some people, or people just talking among themselves, and say, man, the winters are really long here. In our community, there's a lot of challenges in this community. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if, if there was a community center, a place where people could come, and people who don't attend the church, people who don't even know God, wouldn't it be great? And, and all of a sudden, these ideas, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be and then somebody stood up, and I, and I assume as Pastor Jason said, no, we should do that. We should do that. That's what the church is supposed to do. You see, that's what vision is. It's a mental picture of what could be fueled by a passion that it should be. I heard, I heard this illustration 
uh, by Bill Hybels. And I, I, love, I love this illustration that he gives. How many of you grew up in the days watching Popeye on Saturday mornings? Popeye, we remember Popeye. He goes through the same scenario over and over and over again. So he is with his girl and olive oil, and they're walking down the street, and, and just he and olive oil. And, and then along comes the, the bully, Brutus. And Brutus comes into the picture, and he's got the hots for olive oil. And so what does he do? He takes, uh, he takes Popeye, and he ties him up into a pretzel, and leaves him all tied up, and then he kidnaps olive oil, and, and she's screaming, Popeye, Popeye! And Popeye is just fuming mad, and you see his face turning red, and he's trying to untie himself, and he's able to reach into his back pocket, and he pulls out the spinach, and before he pulls out the spinach, he says these words. He says, he's looking at her, and he says, that's all I can stand. I can't stand it no more. <laughs> Pops the spinach in his mouth, and <laughs> runs up the bruise, <laughs> in the face, and then he, and he saves his gal. Right? You've seen that episode, right? <laughs> oh, Popeye. That's the feeling I get at this church. That you're at that place, you got that I can't stand it no more. You, you, you drive through your community. I can't stand it no more. I can't stand to see the addiction. I can't stand to see the oppression. I can't stand to see people living their lives without Jesus. I can't stand it no more. And there's power in that vision. Jesus had that same vision. In Luke 4.18, he, he, he's prophesying. Well, he's speaking a prophecy that was spoken about in the Old Testament. And he said, this is my vision. I want you to get my vision for being here on this earth. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to bring the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives would be released and that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. You see, you see the vision here? I want you to get the vision. Jesus has come to give us a message of hope, a message of freedom. It's a spiritual message that we, we don't need to live in the bondage of our sins, but we can have the gospel that sets mankind free. And that when we receive this message, that we have the ability to be set free free from addictions and strongholds in our lives, that, the, that he would release the captives through this message, that this message would set the oppressed free, that people don't need to live in anxiety and depression and mental illness any longer. Amen. 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 My wife and I, we were just, uh, we, one of our summer trips, we went to New Orleans to the World War II Museum, just awesome place. I, just, I love history. And you go through this one hallway and you see these, these leaders of the Axis. So you see Adolf Hitler, you see Mussolini, you see Hirohito. And, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And you, you see earlier displays of how many millions of lives were affected, how many millions of people died because of this vision of these three men and their vision of bondage and slavery over the world. Three men. Their vision, and I want you to know that vision still exists today, right? That vision is still, there's still a conflict. But then the, the world, the free world came together and said, we, that's all we can stand, we can stand it no more. We've got to do something. And they came together and they fought against this vision of bondage because they brought into a vision of freedom, but I want you to know a vision of freedom calls for an all-out response. You see, the, the world powers could have said, the free powers, they could have said, well, that's just them. That's just the way the world is. But they said, no, we got to respond. And I want you to know many, 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 many thousands of lives were sacrificed because of that response to the vision. Are you with me this morning? Amen. I want you to know God, he can just make things happen, snap of a finger, but somehow, some way, for some reason, God calls us to join with him in his vision. God calls you. God is calling you to join with him in that vision. In the story of Exodus, there's this man named Moses, 
And God laid it on his heart. He gave him my can't stands it any longer spirit in him. And he caused him to this great vision, this great vision of freedom. You see, at this time, the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians. And, and it says that God heard their cries for help. And, and God was at that point, he can't stand it, I can't stand it any longer. And so he responds, and he calls a man, a normal man, just like you and you and you and you. He calls just a normal, ordinary person to a great vision. And he calls them to respond to this great vision. I want you to know, church, New Life Church, God is calling you, an ordinary person with ordinary giftings, to a great vision. And God is calling you to a great response. So in, their, in, the, in the wilderness, now, they're, now he's gotten them out of Egypt, but they're still in the wilderness. And, and, and they went through some battles. And how many of you know that just because you're a Christ follower does not exempt you from battles? We know that happens, right? We, we go through battle. And so the Israelites come across, they come into this battle. I want to read this for you in Exodus 17, 8 through 15. It says, while the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. And Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses and Aaron and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands, so his hands held steady until sunset. And as a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. And after the victory, the Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder and read it aloud to Joshua. I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar there and named it Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. Uh, this, this morning, I want to talk to you. I think we see in this story that the success of a great vision requires four must-haves. If you want to take some notes this morning, I want to give you four must-haves. You must have this. New life must have these four things. This great vision that God has given you for this community center is going to happen. Four things that you must have. First of all, a great vision requires a great fall in. I want you to see the root, the root words of fall in. The root words are all in. All in. That means God has calling not just a few, but God has called the Church, if you are a member of this church, I want you to raise your hand right now. A member of this church. If you are a participant, a regular attender of this church, everybody, if you're, if you're part of this church, this is your church. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about an all in. Everybody, I just want you to look at it. I look at the person next to you and say, he's talking about you. He's talking about you. Look to the other person and say, yeah, he's talking about you too. He's talking about you too. Everybody has a part to play. That's what it means when, when it's an all-in event. Everybody has something to give. Listen to this verse here. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. You see, this battle was going to take an all-in effort from everybody. Now, now the, this is the Israelites is a lot there. It's a lot like the church, I've noticed. You see, the, the Israelites, they're in this situation, and they have this guy, Moses, just an ordinary guy, an ordinary leader, but God calls him to a great vision, and he calls him to be the leader. And, and, and every church who's doing has a great vision has a pastor. And you, again, you have a great pastor at this church. Amen? Amen? You have a great pastor. And just, uh, yeah, please respond to that. You do. I'm going to be honest. I, I, 
there's some churches I could go to and I'd have a hard time saying that. I'm just, just saying. So, so you have Aaron and her, and these are Moses' leaders. That's kind of like the staff and the elders. Can I have the staff and the elders? If you would raise your hand. If you're a staff or an elder in this church, will you raise your hand? I'm looking around this room. I've been seeing some people. Staff and elders, yeah. These, thank you. Thank you very much. Can we just give a shout out for them serving in the church? And, and, then we have, and then we have Joshua, and he's like a ministry leader in the church. And, 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 and can I just have all ministry leaders? If you're a ministry leader in this church, will you raise your hand? Ministry leaders, yes. Thank you for the ministry leaders. Thank you for what you're doing. You're making a difference. And, but then, then we have the people who are on the serve team. This is the army. This is the army, and these are the people who, who serve out in front, at the door, the, the guys who are running this, the, uh, the sound and the audio, uh, they're, they're running all of that, the visual, uh, these are the ushers, these are the prayer people, these are people on the worship team, these are people who are serving in a church. If you serve in this church, will you just give it, raise your hand, can we just give a shout out to you? You are making the church happen. Thank you for doing what you're doing. But then we have... This other person, the most important person, we have God. Amen. And I want you to know, God always, I don't know why he always does it this way, but he always seems to, to fight through those who choose to respond. Let me say that one more time. God always, he just seems to choose to fight through those who respond to his vision. So the question is, how do you go all in? How do you go all in? And, and, and Exodus 4, if we kind of reverse the story a little bit, how did, how did Moses get into this situation in the first place? And it says here that, that, that God and Moses are having this discussion, and Moses is like, I don't want to. Have you ever had one of those discussions with God when he's telling you to do something, and you're like, I don't want to. How many of you ever recognized in ministry, when you do something ministry-wise, you, you always have that, I don't want to. But how many of you recognize every time you felt like I don't want to, but you did, you walk away saying that's the best thing I ever did in my life. I'm so glad that that happened. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I said yes. Well, Moses is in that argument situation with God, and he's doubting. He says, and Moses protested again. He says, what if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. He says, I want you to throw it down on the ground. Now this was, this is for, for Moses, that shepherd's staff. That, re, that, re, that resembled, that was his identity. That was his occupation. That was how he got his provision. That was his security. Can, can, can I just ask you to just put your hand out right now? Can I ask you, what is in your hand? What's in your hand? You can put your hand down there, you know, but I'm going to tell you, there's three things right here. I'm going to fast forward, guys, just a little bit. Three things that are in your hands. Each and every one of you have this given to you by God in your hands. Number one, you have time. You have your time, and you have the ability to choose what you do with the time that God has given to you. We don't know when the end is. We know there was a beginning and God has given us this time. The second thing that God has given to you is your talents. You have giftings that have been given to you by God. And there's some giftings that you do not have. For instance, if I, if I was to turn this on and start playing for you, you would quickly recognize I do not have this gifting. And I, and I really, I'm going to hurt the kingdom of God if I insist on using this gifting for his purposes, right? That, that would be, don't do it. There are many of you screaming, no, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. You trust me, you don't want me to, you don't want me singing. You don't want, you don't want that. Because I've recognized that my giftings are right here. And so God has given to you your gifts. He's given you your time. He's given to you your talents. And he's given to you your treasures. And all that you own here on this earth, this is going to be hard to hear, okay? But please listen to me. Everything that you have of a possession of your treasures, your children, 
your home, that boat, that car, that special car, all that you own. Please be prepared to hear this. It's not yours. It's not yours. It's God's. And I'm going to tell you, the sooner that you, you recognize it and own it, the sooner you're going to experience a new freedom in Christ Jesus. Because some of you are held in bondage by the things that's in your hands. Because what did God tell Moses to do with that? What was in his hands? He says, I want you to throw it down. You know what he's saying to him? I want you to surrender the things that you cherish so deeply. And I want you to give them to me. So that if we ask the question, how do you go all in with God? I say to you, surrender what's in your hands. Start there. Say, God, I surrender all that's in your hands. I surrender my heart. I surrender my mind. Because sometimes I look at this vision thing and how, how they're doing it. And I'm not sure that they're doing I'm not sure I would do it that way. Or I'm not sure, well, the finances, it just doesn't add up. I'm not sure we should do that because the math doesn't. How many of you know that God works with fuzzy math sometimes? It just, it, I, I'm telling you, I've been building projects in churches before, and so many times it just doesn't add up, and God just works his fuzzy math. Can we just give a, just a praise to God for his fuzzy math sometimes? I will take God's provision any day over man's finances. Amen. Any day. Oh, give me, the, give me the provision. Thank you, God. So we're talking about must-haves. You, you, if, if this great vision is going to be fulfilled, a great vision requires great fall-in, and that means everybody, everybody. A great vision requires great faith. He says here in verse 9, Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. How many of you are kind of bothered by this battle planned? That doesn't make sense. You're, you're just going to hold up a staff? <coughs> Pastor, really? I mean, we're, we're, we're going to go out and fight this battle for you. You're just going to hold up a staff? You ever, ever had those times with God before where that just doesn't make sense? The, the battle plan just doesn't make sense. And here's what I've noticed in life, that when I walk out my faith in my vision, there's always impossibilities that I just can't get over. But I've also noticed that when I walk out my faith through God's vision, that I'm reminded that with God, all things are possible. And I want to encourage this church. You're going to need an all-in faith to see this vision happen. I want to encourage you to walk by faith. It says here in Hebrews 11, one says, Now faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. What that is saying is like, God, I don't. I think we need to come to that place. God, I don't always understand it. I don't know how this works. It's just kind of a humbling place to be. But God, I trust you. God, I do believe that with you all things are possible. And you know what? Faith requires, it says this, that it is impossible. It is impossible to please God without faith. Yeah, that's just how God operates. God is honored by your faith. God is pleased by your faith. He's pleased by that humble spirit that says, God, I trust you. He's humbled. He loves that. Great faith requires us to answer this great question. What do I believe? Now, I'm a chaplain. And I was in a workplace the other day, and some lady was just, and she goes, as a chaplain, can I ask you a question? I don't know where in the world this question came from. Do you believe the earth is flat? <laughs> I just had no idea where to go. Like, no. But I, and she wanted to know why I think. I'm like, I really don't know. I said, can I just, can I turn this on you? I said, I really, 
I really don't put my mind on a, on a lot of things. You know, maybe it is flat, but I'm okay with it, I guess. I don't know. I said, you know what I really, where I put my mind a lot? I put my mind on this, this question is, what do I believe? I really spend a lot of time there. Can I ask you, Christ follower, can I ask you to question, what do I believe? And I'm going to phrase it in three more questions. Okay, here's, here's going to, how we're going to determine what you believe. First of all, I want to ask you the question, in your heart of hearts, is there a God? Because it starts right there. That's foundational. Is there a God? Okay? Answer that question, yes or no. Yes or no question. Number two, who is he? Because once you answer that, because there's lots of gods we, we got to choose from, right? We got a whole bunch of world religions, and we got stuff that we're making up all the time. I mean, so we got to, so who is he? Who is God to you? Because once you recognize who he is, and then you can define what he's all about. You can define his character. You know, you can know. For as Christ followers, we have this Bible, and it defines for us his character. It defines for us his promises. It tells us about his presence and his activity in our lives, right? So I ask you, what, what is it that you believe? Is there a God? Who is he? And then I think the most important one then is, what is your response to him? What is your response? What is your response to God? I love what D.L. Moody says about those who choose to be empowered by God's vision rather than limiting visions of man. He says this, the world is yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by the church who is fully devoted and wholly consecrated to him. I love that. It's, so I want to move on here. Must-haves. A great vision requires great fall-in. A great vision requires a great faith. And number three, a great vision requires great follow-through. So it says here, so, so Joshua and his army, they were all in, okay? And so they, they got, I can just kind of see it, they gathered up the troop. You know, everybody calls in and everybody's all lined up here and they're all ready to go. But we know nothing happens until there's movement. Nothing happens until there's follow through, and it says here in verse 10, so Joshua did what Moses had commanded, and he followed through. He fought the army of Amalek. You see, great follow through simply means deploying your gifts. It means I'm going to take my gifts. I'm going to take the shovel, and I'm going to dig. I'm going to take the pen and I'm going to write. I'm going to take my hands and put them on the wheel. I'm going to take my money and give to the capital campaign. I'm going to take my knees and put them to the floor, and I'm going to pray. Here's, here's what I believe. We as Christ followers, we should not expect God to show up with a miracle if we're not willing to show up for him to work through. Let me say that one more time. We should not expect God to show up with a miracle if we're not willing to show up for him to work through. The brother of Jesus, James, was at one time a Christ doubter and then became a Christ follower, a devoted Christ follower. And he says this about our faith. He says, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without breath good works, without action, without movement. Your faith is dead. I'm a, I'm a chaplain for the fire department in De Pere, and every once in a while I'll get a text and a call, and I'll see these, these letters P and B. And that means that it's pulseless, non-breathing. That means it's not a good situation. That means there's a body on the floor, and there is no movement. And when there's absolutely no movement and there's no pulse, that means it's dead. And so it is. That's what James is saying about our faith. If there's no movement, you can have a sign. You can wear the T-shirt that says, I'm a Christ follower. But if there's no movement, if there's no pulse, if there's no action in faith, it's dead. Christ did not, he did not call us to be dead. He called us to be alive. In fact, Paul says that we are called to be living sacrifice. So I want to ask you this question. 
In what ways is God calling you to show up in this great vision that God has given to this church? Let me move on. Four must-haves. A great vision requires great fallen. A great vision requires great faith. A great vision requires great follow-through. And number four, a great vision requires great focus. How many of you... How many, how many of you have been so distracted throughout this, this message? <laughs> I sometimes sit in services and I get so distracted making grocery lists and all kinds of social media. Some of you guys have scrolled through Facebook enough and Instagram, okay? We get distracted. But you know when I get most distracted? I get distracted when I'm tired. <laughs> and sometimes people are talking to me and it sounds just like this. So tell me about yourself. Well, you know, an organized person, somebody who does not need details. I'm actually very, very good with groups. I've surpassed all my goals like these positions. My prior job and your competitor. My personality and me have surpassed their own goals. Get famous at mytalkingstain.com. Can I be a confessing pastor? Sometimes that's what we hear. Because <laughs> we're tired. Sometimes pastors get tired. That's why I love this church that you would, you would recognize that in your pastor. You see, your pastor has just gone through a very, very, very difficult season in his life. Tired in body, tired in spirit, tired in mind. And what a church to gather around him and just love on him and say, yeah, you need a break, Pastor. We want to give that gift to you. Because when you lose focus, it's hard. I love this part here. It is in verse 11 and 12, it says, as long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Maybe you know that happens in the church. Pastor grows tired. Just ah, something happens. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hand so his hands held steady until sunset. Moses was tired. And that's when our faith often gets distracted, is when we get tired. And God has just sent people in my life when I was a pastor to just come and my a friend of mine named Ben Herman. God just sent him into my life in a season when I was just so tired. But I need to ask you this morning, who in this church is holding up the arms of their pastor? Who's holding your pastor's arms up? Somebody just, well, how, how do you do that? I, I, I just say, I, I, the word honor comes to my mind, honor. How do you honor your pastor? How do you honor your pastor? I, I, I would tell you this. Number one, the number one thing your pastor needs is your prayer. I'm telling you, your pastor needs to be, because pastors are notorious. We got smiley face on the outside and got chaos going on on the inside, okay? I, I just want to break the news to you. Maybe you never knew this, but pastors are not perfect. And if your pastor has not failed you yet, he's going to. He's just a really good faker. <laughs> Because he's a man. He's a man with a calling on his life. But he's imperfect, just like you are too. But he needs your prayer support. He needs your prayer support. And he needs your encouragement. You know how, can I just tell you how to encourage your pastor? This is how you do it. Walk up to your pastor. Send him a text. Send him an email. Send him a, a Facebook message, an Instagram, whatever. Just say, Pastor. I appreciate you, but don't stop there. And then tell him why. Tell your pastor the difference he's making. Because you go home and you talk, oh, he's great, oh, he's awesome, he's awesome. Don't, don't just tell them, don't tell him yourself. Pastor, I appreciate you. And here's why. And the third way to honor your pastor is to grab a shovel. Because I want you to know your pastor and your staff, they are digging. They're all in on this, on this vision because they're just, they can't stand it no more. Can't stand it. 
And you're, the, way you, the best way, that, the thing that encourages a pastor the most is, 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 you know, they love it when people say, add a boy, pastor. But man, when you grab a shovel, oh, it brings tears to his eyes. Thank you. Thank you. And I encourage you, who's holding up the arms of the pastor? Who's holding up your arms? Because we were never meant to do faith alone. And whose arms are you holding up? As we close, I want you to see one last thing, that God's vision requires God's glory. Because we see here in this passage here, 13 and 15, as a result, as a result of the follow-through, of the faith, of, of the focus, of the fallen, we see that the battle was won. Success came because of what was required, because they followed through with what was required. But I want you to see where the glory was given. Because here's the temptation of churches when, when success comes their way. The temptation is for the church to make it about themselves. Finally, we have an instrument here to grow our church. Church, please don't do that. No, 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 no. It's not about growing your church. It's about blessing this community. It's about growing the kingdom of God. Amen? It's about the kingdom of God. It's not about you. I beg of you, church. I beg of you. I ask because I've seen it happen so many times. Please, I just beg of you. One last thing. Don't allow this community center to turn into a Christian country club. Don't let it happen. God gave you a great vision. And that vision is always about setting people free in Jesus' name. So can we pray for this vision right now in Jesus' name? We pray, God, this great vision that you've given this church. You know where they're at. You know what's happening, God. You know the provision that needs to be brought in. God, you know the condition of, of the pastor. He, just, he needs more of you during this time. And so, God, I pray that you would call those right now who are maybe not fully into this right now, that today they grab shovels. On our way out, we grab the shovels and we say, we're all in. And we're praying that lives would be changed in the city of Escanaba. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we just give God praise right now? In Jesus' name. Can I ask, as, as we close, can I ask right now, those who will commit with me to hold up the arms of their pastor, will you stand right now? You will commit as of today. I will hold up the arms of my pastor. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.